while I'm setting up, I did my PhD in statistics, uh, as you could have guessed. I also did a law degree after my PhD, and some of my research has really looked at the intersection of these two fields, and I'll get to a little bit of that in my talk. The first thing I want to say is thank you, Liz, and all the organizers for really an extraordinary opportunity to come and present to a very diverse audience of highly motivated people, so it's really a pleasure. I was um, thrilled last night on the SS Great Britain when Vice Chancellor Breakwell cited reproducibility as one of the reasons we might be interested in issues of data curation and open data. And I hope what I'll be able to do is um, expand on her ideas. So just before I start my talk, uh, this is the latest issue of Science Magazine. And this came out uh, four days ago. Or like three and a half if you're in the US, on December 2nd. And they have, um, this is a special issue dedicated to, as you can see, data replication and reproducibility. So I've been working on these issues of reproducibility for many years, I guess three, I guess it's not that many, but it feels like a number of years. And this is really, I think, a watershed point when Science, one of our, uh, probably the hardest magazine, or journal to get published in, um, turns its eye to something, an, an issue like reproducibility and like replication, an issue that affects everybody interested in data, open data, curation, and um, associated issues. So if you haven't seen it, take a look. They have um, a number of issues on uh, reproducible research and computational science, and then they give many examples of issues that we come, uh, come across when we try and do reproducible research. So why is that important? This is what I want to convince you of today. Reproducible research. So I think um, the concept of reproducible research is something that can help frame an agenda for data curation and for understanding these issues that we're all confronting. And I've heard um, so many issues discussed today already, um, and we're only a part way through the conference. So why would we curate? Why are we even interested in data curation um, as a first principle? We can say glibly, science is open. So of course we, our data should be open and we should be able to curate this data. But in a sense that's begging the question, why is science open? Why are we even thinking about these issues? The reason science is open traces back to the scientific method. And the m main purpose in the scientific method is of course to root out error. So one of the things that we're trying to do as scientists is we're trying to work very hard in everything we do to convince our peers and others that we've done everything we can to root error out and these are the results the best that we have. And we have this attitude of skepticism, so everybody involved in that discussion will know you may have missed an error here or there's something wrong there. What are you going to do about this? And you have a very skeptical dialogue, idea being that then we winnow things down and get closer and closer to the truth. Now today, as we've encountered things like the data deluge, enormous amounts of computational power giving rise to the ability to do truly massive simulations of some extraordinary um, data, it seems like in this f digitized frenzy that we've forgotten this. And often in conferences and in papers today, you see what we've been, what I've called um, breezy demos, right? You see implementations, here's what I've done, isn't this cool, and here are some results, here are some figures that, that are pretty sweet. So that's not the situation that I just described about a skeptical dialogue and rooting out error. That's something completely different. So David Donahoe is my advisor, and he has a nice quote paraphrasing what I, what I just said on this slide. Um, and I'll read it because the text is so small. The idea is an article about computational science in a scientific publication is not the scholarship itself. It's merely advertising of the scholarship. The actual scholarship is the complete software environment and the complete set of instructions that generated the figures. So this leads me to think about reproducibility and the difficulties of reproducibility in digitized science. And if we think about reproducibility as a cornerstone of the scientific method, as what allows us to tell the story of our research, to convince others that we've done everything we can to root out error, to allow them to verify and validate our results, then it's something that allows us to frame this discussion that we have about open data and about open science. In that, in that, in that framing, Open, da open data becomes a very natural corollary to reproducible research. Without the data, how are you ever going to replicate those results that are published? Reproducibility allows you to talk about code in the same discussion. In many, many discussions of open data, 
they don't talk about the code and this to me is um, a great tragedy without code you don't have data if the da there's somehow that data set got where it is in some way and that's absolutely due to code and the results that are being generated and published in these discoveries they wouldn't get there without the code either and I feel like code is an intrinsic part of this discussion of openness, of open science, of verifiability. Reproducibility as a concept allows us to frame code very naturally in the discussion, just as data is framed very naturally in the discussion as well. Reproducibility gives us guidance on what to share, how to share it, what's important, what to prioritize. In a number of discussions with scientists, just on a one-on-one -on -one level, the concept of open data isn't clear at all. Do I share? before publication, after publication? Um, should I share everything, all the versions that I've gone through? Um, if you think about reproducibility, this, then it becomes very clear to the computational science what's important to share and what they can focus their energies on. So that leads me to my next point, that to communicate with scientists about sharing and to motivate, it's best to meet them where they are. Reproducibility is a concept every scientist understands and accepts. They may not have realized the gaps in their own work about reproducibility, and um, I don't think I'm being too harsh to say that, that there are many, but this is something that they get. Like I said, open data or other terms like open science, it doesn't have a concrete meaning to their everyday um, practice of science. Reproducibility is very clear. So in my discussions, um, with this, scientists often understand exactly what I mean, and then, you know, I have this reaction, I, I didn't think of that, because they just sort of have gone through um, learning science in a particular way, and then they can actually start to see how issues of reproducibility are important to their work, important to verification, and how they can then step to um, a more sharing mindset in how they approach their work. Not to mention we, we do better at establishing facts when we have reproducibility. It's been with us since the 1660s. And then reproducibility, sharing code, sharing data, sharing the means to recreate those results allows us to really share science and communicate scientifically, not just with peers in the ivory tower the way it used to be, but of course as an, as an open way and an engagement in even a public dialogue and discourse. So what I've described sounds very nice and very easy, but of course, as we've already seen through today, there are pl plenty of difficulties in how to implement this. There's, um, I can say, three words that could probably comprise days of talks on their own, um, tools to facilitate reproducibility and how you capture your workflow as you're going in such a way that you can share it. Um, infrastructure, how do we support scientists who want to share data and share code and do so in, such, in a reproducible way? And then, of course, incentives to do that, and we've heard lots of discussion about this. It also requires long-term access. So reproducibility, this isn't something where we have scientific knowledge and then it dissipates. Right, so there's really a strong imperative towards curation, towards a longevity of these results. It's an open question how long the, these would last for. I think it comes down to the community and it comes down to other factors, um, probably expense. And it's also um, opens another host of issues in terms of, well, how long does code function? How, how, um, how, how easy is it to preserve data sets? So thinking about code and thinking about access to scientific knowledge, in the raw data set, set itself, the discoveries may be embedded in there, but they're not immediately apparent. And it really is the code that allows us to travel that journey towards understanding the um, scientific contributions in the discoveries. Another point I'd like to make as a statistician, I certainly see this, is that Many deep intellectual contributions to scientific understanding are embedded only in the code. There are methods of analysis, model building, of understanding data, of teasing out signal from noise, that are contributions that really are happening only in code. And it's a, a very serious mistake not to include those in our discussion of scientific output. Um, these are can be described in papers, but it's very difficult to get the implementations the way the scientist has intended it without actual access to their code. Okay, so, so I have a slide because I think code is an important enough issue to emphasize this. Um, as I said earlier, digital data sets implies the existence of some kind of code. It's inescapable. So I was calling this um, the... Uh, I guess they're sort of tied together in a, a symbiotic way, and you can't really discuss one without the other. 
It's very difficult, given our publishing standards today, that are very similar to our same publishing standards from the 1970s, before we had any digitization in science, to replicate the work that someone's discussing in a paper. And you've probably all seen this in a four-page conference paper or a small methods section. You've probably written such things. It's almost impossible to capture every step that you would need to really understand how those results were created. Uh, for example, what are all the parameter settings on the functions that you ran? What order did you run those functions in? Are there, do, does the, the code that you wrote to do this implementation or the code that you used, does it actually match what you wrote about in the paper? All of this is hidden at the moment for the vast majority of scientific publications. Um, one question I'm often asked in this context when I advocate reproducibility is, well, if I share the code and I share the data, what use is it to science if I can just immediately regenerate someone else's results? I just can download their code, run it, and get 5.5, or whatever their results were, or regenerate the figure. And I think there's, um, and so the idea is what they want to do is encourage people to independently regenerate those same results. So, and I, I think that's exactly right, but I would like to make a slightly deeper argument, which is that we need both. We absolutely need the independent replication to verify these results, but suppose someone goes ahead and does that independent recoding and regenerates these, these same results and gets 5.6. So who's right? My 5.5, their 5.6. So we need both. We need to have the open code to reconcile the differences in the implementations. Okay, so open data. Open data itself is a very loose concept. And I think that um, you very quickly run into a number of very difficult questions for a scientist who has the best of intentions and wants to reproduce open data, uh, reproduce their, their um, data openly and wants to share it and it subscribes to everything we all subscribe to in this room. Then they look at their particular case where they're working. They look at their data sets and, and what they're doing and then they wonder, do I have to put it all out there, everything I've got? What do I do with different versions that I have of the data that some are tied to some results? Some never actually um, end up in a result, but they're on the path to getting a result as part of data cleaning methodologies, for example. At what point do I share this? Is this something, as we saw earlier in the, this morning, is it something where data is shared? Is it sort of comes onto my machine and in, into in to my workspace? Or is this something that I share when, you know, I get a couple of emails later after I publish? Or when do I actually share the data? Um, what if I have data that I haven't used in my research, but, um, but I have it, it's part of it. Do I have to share this? Um, and what is data? Some discussions of data include code, uh, they call that data. So even it's a fuzzy border on what you would call data as well. What kind of metadata, documentation, tags, ontologies? What do I need to do to make that? What level am I trying to pitch this data? Do I send it to my peers or my collaborators down the hall that know my research intimately? Or is this something where I'm expected to make this available to um, seven-year-olds, for example? Who's the audience? And how do I archive this? And what's my time horizon? So these are all questions I think legitimately arise in the mind of someone who, with best of intentions, wants to share their data. And it's not immediately clear what the answers are. And they can take best guesses. But what I'd like to submit to you is that arguing reproducibility and reproducible research answers many of these questions, if not all of them. So this isn't important just because we understand this agenda in this room. This is important because lack of verifiability and lack of reproducibility is producing a credibility crisis across the computational sciences. And it's not something that's isolated to very big models or someone who's making use of massive simulations. This is something affecting anyone working with a computer doing their research, which is just about everyone. So as a statistician, I looked at the Journal of the American Statistical Association, one of our flagship journals, and I was interested in how pervasive computation was um, over time. I looked, 1996, nine of 20 articles, almost half had a computational element, and the ones that weren't computational, they were doing mathematical proofs. None of these computational papers talked about where I could get the code, or even what package they'd used, or any kind of documentation whatsoever. They just sort of said, here are my, here are my computational results. 
Uh, fast forward 10 years later, almost all the articles now have a computational component. So they may have a mathematical proof, but then they have some kind of example that's been done on a computer, or the article may be wholly computational. 33 out of 35. Nine percent of those 33 articles discussed the code itself and the availability where you might download a package. 2009-2011, everybody's doing computational work if you're publishing in JASA. We're up to 21% talking about where they can get the code. So this is infinitely better than zero, of course, but it's still not very good when you think about things like replication of the results and all the issues that I've been talking about. Code and data not made available at the time of publication. We're facing a credibility crisis. We, University of East Anglia was mentioned this morning. You can interpret ClimateGate as a failure to communicate the methods, the underlying data, and, um, and how the results were actually produced. Um, that's something that certainly permeated into public consciousness. There was um, a clinical trial scandal at Duke University last year causing one professor to resign. The work that had, that had produced and gone to clinical trial was based on work that could not be, re computational work that could not be reproduced. And I'll talk, I could talk about those two more if you're interested in the break. So here's the way that I was thinking about this. This is my advisor, David Donahoe, the one who wrote the quote um, earlier about the advertising of the scholarship. So we understand science uh, and the scientific method as having a number of branches. So the first branch of the scientific method is the deductive branch. So things that fall into this branch, the oldest branch, mathematics and logic and so on, that are part of deductive systems. The second branch of the scientific method developed when we started doing empirical work. We're no longer enclosed in a deductive world and we need to have new methods for um, what we mean by a scientific fact in that setting. There's lots of talk, and there has been for five or more years, about the third branch of the scientific method stemming from increased computational power and simulations. Fourth branch, the data deluge. Um, we're doing new kinds of data-driven discovery and so on. What I'd like to argue, and the reason I have a question mark next to branch three there, is that computational science cannot be elevated to the status of a branch of the scientific method until we're routinely genera generating verifiable research and results. So back to the ubiquity of error. Central motivation for the scientific method to root out error. These two branches of the scientific method, the deductive and the empirical branch, are hundreds of years old. This is a problem that they've grappled with. Computational science, maybe we've been at it two decades, and this is our next challenge to figure this out. In the deductive branch, there's the well-defined notion of the proof. Anyone publishing, um, say, in a mathematics journal, you wouldn't try and publish a theorem without a proof, and what that proof is is well understood. Um, believe me, I've been caught in that a number of times. Um, and so, the, so that's something that they have standards for how they're communicating their work such that it can be replicated. The empirical branch, we have developed the machinery of hypothesis testing and very structured communication about the methods of our results. And the reason for this is to allow for verification of the results, replication by other labs or, or um, other, by other researchers. And as I said earlier, computational science, today we are still developing these standards. We don't have these standards, and these are necessary for us to consider ourselves as a part of the scientific method or as another branch of the scientific method. Breezy demos don't cut it. So I have a small reference there. The, um, um, Ioannidis, why pu most published research findings are false, so he's focusing on the medical community and trying to bring attention to this issue as well. So this is, this is a blizzard of words slide, and the only reason that, by the way, all the slides are on my website, um, stodden.net, and you could be following along, but the only reason that I put this here is to try and convince you that this isn't something that I'm advocating and everyone else is ignoring. This is something that the idea of reproducibility and the concern about the credibility crisis in computational science is something that's arising um, all over computational sciences. So in applied mathematics, in geosciences, in um, uh, bioinformatics, they're concerned about it, and so these are lots of workshops and um, committees that are formed to discuss this issue and try and resolve the problem. So what I wanted to say in closing is give you a call to action. Um, data and code must be open, long-term access assured as an issue of a scientific imperative if we're moving towards the notion of computational science being truly a science. 
Um, I developed in 2009 the reproducible research standard, the idea being um, a legal framing for the release of code, a release of data, and your paper as a compendium to allow for reproducibility. So essentially realigning our intellectual property framework to be more like our scientific norms uh, in, in, in sharing with attribution. That's the subject of a whole other talk that, that takes longer than 20 minutes. Um, and the idea is that the framing of reproducible research is really a path towards elevating computational science to a third branch of the scientific method and providing the openness and scoping of the issue that so many of us have been talking about here and are interested in. So I give you a few references and, and I'll just close there. Um, policy or uh, practice are not captured by reproducibility. Um, one of the main benefits that's often talked about with respect to open data is data reuse and data repurposing, and that I'm not sure if that's captured by the concept. So I'm, I'm curious if you could address that. Well, I think we need to be careful about what we're asking scientists to do. <clears throat> like for, um, at least in my understanding of the history of science, there hasn't been a value on reuse per se. Reuse is something that happens in a corollary way because of the value that that um, actual piece of science has had. So we end up being um, finding reuse Im important through citation as a corollary to sharing primary methods and being reproducible. So I feel like reuse follows from reproducibility in a very clear way. And I think um, the other points that were raised today about citation for data and for code are very important to allow um, credit for that type of reuse, but I don't see how you have reuse without openness to reproducibility. So I think, I think they're very tightly linked concepts. And um, one of the points I was trying to make in the talk was that, for example, if you feel reuse is your issue and it's extremely important to you, I think the framing of reproducibility is, in my opinion, the best vehicle to push reuse forward. Uh, for Victoria, I'm still Bob Morris. Uh, <laughs> I, I was very interested in your historical data about the, uh, the citation of, of the uh, code. My experience with biologists is that they, they're perfectly capable of citing the actual program, let's say the R program that they wrote, but they don't know what the rest of provenance tracking of execution of a program is all about. So I'm kind of wondering if you did any um, quality evaluation of those citations, uh, like down to the versions of the platform they were using, the operating system, and so on. How good is the citation that you that you tried? That's an absolutely excellent question. So what I did for that particular plot was I was extremely generous and had a very low bar, and if they sort of talked about using R and where they could get, then I, then I put them in the bin of having discussed it. So it was more like, did they even have some rudimentary awareness that the issue was important? Um, I think a secondary study digging into the who is sharing, and, and if you are sharing, is it even implementable would be very valuable, and that's something that um, I would be happy for anyone to take on, and I could, I could take on myself. This is something that dovetails into some of my current research that I haven't had a chance to talk about, um, which is what are journal policies regarding code sharing and regarding data sharing. So I'm out taking snapshots now of uh, what, who, who requires what in, in, the, in the journal space. And this is something that um, journals have tackled with, and you can see elements of this coming out. And I think that's something that I can incorporate into, into this study with, it, with any luck. But it's very important. Maybe I can take the chair's prerogative and ask a question. Um, I have a question for Mark. 
about the, the peer review implications of Figshare, and, and I'm sure you've been thinking about that, and I'm sure lots of people have raised it. Would you like to talk about that? Uh, yeah, so there is no, uh, you put the data out there, and essentially the peer review is post-publication peer review, in the sense that uh, on the screenshots I showed you of what it, the outcome looked like, the article pages, if you call them, uh, you can comment on that. Anyone is free to... And the, the thing, I mean, I understand that some people would like peer review, and so they can publish their uh, publications in the way that they do now, in open access journals. But the, um, the, the, the way in which it's been used at the moment already, people... The thing is, if you put something on the internet, people take it and use it in ways that you didn't even know they could. And so you can get an RSS feed of your, all your research data that's on Figshare. Somebody has already taken this, put this onto FriendFeed, which is another social network, and uh, people started commenting back. So it was preliminary data, and they started saying, have you thought about doing this? Perhaps you could increase the viscosity or whatever. Well, I didn't understand it, but <laughs> somebody did somewhere. I wanted to follow up on that question because that's... Um, uh, so uh, I wanted to disaggregate a little bit and talk about peer review of the paper versus peer review of the code and peer review of the data. And um, for a while, I think when I first started thinking about this, I just lumped it all in with pre-publication peer review. And then I had a discussion with um, an editor of Science who said, no, reproducibility, that's always been something that's happened in the community after publication. And thinking about that, I think that's largely correct. So um, I think there's a real role for post-publication um, peer review and verification of results, um, given some code and data. So I think that that's something that very naturally sidesteps what would be an enormous problem to find reviewers for code and for data pre-publication. Um, and I think this is one place, again, where the, the reproducibility framing can help um, move around that issue in terms of verification post-publication, given code and data are available and the community can then, can then use it and uh, use it just like Mark described. Mm -hmm. oh, this one My name is Ruth McNally, and I'm from the Centre for Economic and Social Aspects of Genomics at Lancaster University. And it's another question about reproducibility. And, um, you know, in the field of science, science studies, there's been some empirical work on the um, issue of reproducibility. And, you know, the thing is about metadata, which in fact is part of what you're talking about, making things open. Um, you know, it's what you need to provide for someone else to do what you did. And in practice, because everybody's situation is slightly different, the knowledges they have, there's an awful amount of tacit knowledge that's brought to these practices that actually cannot be captured. You can never have a full enough disclosure of what it is needed to do what somebody else did. And secondly, I mean, we've been concerned about not getting credit for you know, having your data cited, in the world of scientific um, research, uh, people don't get rewarded for reproducing somebody else's experiment. You know, it doesn't add to the sum total of human knowledge. You're unlikely to be able to publish an exact replication of somebody else's work. So in practice, people generally only attempt to replicate or reproduce what someone else has done when they disagree with them. And in those circumstances, they very rarely come up with the same results for the reasons that you said. And in fact, there are always ways you can explain why you cannot reproduce somebody's results and you have this thing called experimenter's regress, which is the term in the field that's been used to account for that. But I mean, I've been thinking about what you said from the field of proteomics, which is a field that I've been looking at. And there, there's a kind of recognition that in these um, sciences, which have a lot of equipment, a lot of stages, a lot of computation, a lot of inferencing in the end because of the deep sampling that takes place all the way through and all the statistical techniques, they, they live with a kind of inherent ambiguity about the results that come out. And so um, in, the, in that field, the, the, the logic that's being used for um, for providing minimal information about what's been done is a kind of validity check that's adequate 
for the scientific publication guidelines, which do change, and there was a crisis in proteomics around that, but they don't really take the reproducibility issue as really being a practical uh, prospect. And in fact, in the human plasma proteome project, no two laboratories could replicate each other's results. They couldn't even replicate their own. So I'm just wondering um, about this in this context, um, about you know, how that works in uh, com communication with those kind of communities. Well, th that, that's really um, a number of excellent points in there that are quite subtle and quite deep. I'm very glad to have you. So first of all, I think they're related. Um, I'm, I'm very happy you mentioned tacit knowledge, and this is something that has... So reproducibility is not something that's obviously... It's not new in, in when we become more digitized. Tacit knowledge has always been a problem, and there's been lots of work in... Or a few pieces of work in the sociology of science with the difficulty of replication and how it's this gold standard we have as scientists, and yet if you wanted to replicate someone's new rocket or something like this, what happened in practice is you would get researchers from that lab to come over and show you how to do it. And it really didn't have, you, just following the publication itself wouldn't, wouldn't capture enough of the tacit knowledge to, um, to allow you to replicate in practice much of the time. Now, what's interesting about thinking about this in the context of digitization is that um, code actually does capture many of the all of the steps that we do in, in a digital sense. It doesn't capture um, what we might do um, uh, in a physical sense. If, uh, if this, this is involved, like, for example, what you might do in a bio lab, this is still subject to the other notions of, um, the increased notions of uh, tacit knowledge. But the code can track everything that's done to the data. It doesn't necessarily provide the context, right? You might not see why this particular thing was done. So there's still a role for a narrative. But, th but I, I find one of the things that's very compelling about um, the research that I'm doing is that we are actually in a, in a place where there's um, a subtle but deep possible advancement in the fact that switching to digitization gives us the ability to capture this tacit knowledge in a way that we've never been able to before. So sometimes I get questions, um, you know, this has never been a standard. We've had these standards of, you know, replication in the past, they've been good enough. And so, um, but I wonder whether we should be reaching for these ideals and whether what we had in the past was really driven by circumstances and the technology that were available then, and now we're in a different situation with different technology and we can do so much better in terms of communication of the methods. Um, your second point, I believe, about validation well, what, I, what I'm hoping is that uh, there's no question that the replication is, a bre like in, in a sense, my talk was also breezy. Like, I just sort of outlined this. I mean, in 20 minutes, there's not much else I can do. But I outlined this very quickly and just sort of loosely off the cuff said, oh, yes, we'll do this. Um, now, I'm very aware of how difficult this is in many highly complicated modeling problems, particularly when um, there's been black box pieces of software used that have been designed by other researchers. And I think that... So, there, so there's a couple of things. I think that reproducibility is something that um, you don't demand of a researcher after they've done their work. It's something that you know going in. I think it's just too unfair. Like you know going in that this is going to be something that you're going to communicate in a reproducible way, and you can um, craft your workflows in such a sense that it, be it becomes easier, or you're able to perhaps explain, well, you know, this black box software is what I use. The other thing I was thinking that I should have mentioned is that the problems that I'm describing about reproducibility come from the digital aspects. So that I'm thinking about having um, a version of the data set on your hard drive and then having code applied to this and starting there. I wasn't thinking all the way back to the creation of the data set, which is something that um, it's, it's the, it, it has the same problems as the pre-digital age, for example. And so when these, so with regard to credit and doing, doing the replication, um, I agree that there's, there's no, um, you certainly aren't, I mean, there's, there are actually a couple of places where you can publish replication studies now, but they're new and people don't really know about it. And it's not clear that you're going to get the same amount of, you know, high impact if you published in science or nature or whatnot. But on the other hand, um, so, that, so you, you made a point that was very important that when there are controversies, we can dig back in. So this is exceptionally important. The other thing is, if we are capturing more of this ta tacit knowledge and we are able to say in a relatively convenient way, grab code and grab data and replicate the experiment. Now, when I say computational science, I'm talking very small scripts on small data sets that, uh, you know, we could just grab on laptops now and regenerate in open source software to also the extremely complex, high scale, multi-core processes that just are not trivial to replicate no matter how good you are and what information you have access to. 
But um, having done that, many researchers, particularly new postdocs or grad students, they do start by replicating a senior researcher's work. So they will, and maybe it doesn't get published, but this is the jumping off point for a lot of their work. And that quote I had about the advertisement of scholarship, that is David Donahoe, my advisor, paraphrasing Professor John Clairbout, who's in geophysics at Stanford, who's been doing reproducible research for more than 20 years and was the model for what we did as grad students when we had to work reproducible, reproducibly under, under Donahoe. The reason he did this was because he was tired of, and I hope I don't mischaracterize what he's saying, but he was tired of grad students coming into his department and spending um, two years just figuring out what the previous student had done before they can actually start um, producing de novo work and results. He wanted them to be able to come in and sort of hit the ground running and within a few weeks have that replicated and be able to continue the research. Again, that's not published, but that's something that would come out in the quality of the work and the speed at which you're able to produce, produce papers. So I think the notion of reproducibility as an underlying framework is still valid, even though it's not something that you might engage in as an end in itself. So I hope I got all your points. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm conscious that lunch is just about to be served, and so if you have other questions, can you uh, approach the speakers over lunch? I'm sure they're open to that. So we're due back at 2 o'clock. Uh, yeah, most of us, we need to be back here at 2. If you have a poster, I'm going to be presenting in the Minden Madness, can you be back here at 10 to 2? Okay. Thank you. Can we thank our speakers? Before we go? Thank you.